Now for you, uh, uh, so you have UAP, right? And you have UFOs, because we used to hear UFOs, now it's like unidentified, okay, you know. So aliens, and, and you have, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the separating the two. Yourself, with your own eyes, have you seen anything where you're 100% proof for your own self? Like, are you, here's Jesus, here's the 12 disciples, they walk with them, right? And then they go and tell everybody else, look, I hung out with Jesus. Trust me, I saw the stuff, right? Or I saw the resurrection, right? Oh my God, I was there, right? So it's still witness. You're not the main source, but it's the witness. Are you at 100% that both aliens and UAPs exist? So great question. And I think we need to, we need to for your audience's sake, pull that question apart a little bit because it's not so simple. Uh, it may seem like a simple answer, but it's not. And then l let me explain. To me, it. it's simple, but I want to hear how you explain yeah, it. Yeah. And then, and then if, and then let me try to explain it. And then, and then at the end, I'll, I'll give you the simple explanation. Okay. So when you say aliens, people think something from out there. Okay. So I've always told people, uh, when they say, oh, they're from outer space, they could be, they could be from outer space, inner space, or frankly, the space in between. So what do we, what do we, what do we mean by that? This is a wonderfully complex universe we live in. And we are realizing new paradigms almost every day in the world of science. So let me give you a case in point. I told you I went to University of Miami. I studied microbiology and immunology. There, is, there are people, scientists right now, anthropologists, who believe that modern humans, Homo sapiens sapiens, has been around for the last 100 to 200,000 years. It wasn't until the Greeks 2,000 years ago that we actually recognized the two major life forms on this planet. And you were either a plant or you were an animal, and human beings fell into that animal category. And we were very proud of ourselves. And it wasn't until the Renaissance or the uh, days of enlightenment, about 300 some years ago, where we discovered a whole new life form on this planet that we've been sharing all along. And that was the world of fungus. And so again, pat ourselves on the shoulder, you're either plant, an animal, or you're fungus. Now, it wasn't until the last one, think about this, out of 200,000 years of modern human history, uh, of being actually modern humans, not human history, uh, that it was the last 120 years that we actually discovered the true, the true dominant life form on this planet. In fact, if you add up all the biomass of every plant and all the biomass of every animal and all the biomass of every fungus and add it all up together, it still will not equal the biomass of the true dominant life form on this planet. And it wasn't until we could curve glass and look through a little steel tube and famously shout, little beasties, little beasties, did we discover the world of microorganisms that are inside every single human being that makes us up as individuals that can survive on the skin of the ISS space station and can survive the crushing depths of miles of ice uh, underneath the Arctic. So, so plan, animal, fungus, microorganism. Right. So my point being is that this is the true dominant life form that's been on this planet all along. And we just discovered it 120 years ago. So is it possible that these our friends from out of town, these, these UAP, are just as natural to Earth as we are? Maybe we're at the point now where technologically we can start tracking them. Maybe they're from under the ocean. Look, we, we've only mapped less than 10% of the ocean floor. We know more about the surface of the moon than we know about our own oceans. Is it possible these things could be coming from underneath the oceans? Yes, that's possible too. So there's a whole, so when we say the word aliens, we have to be careful because people automatically presume we're talking about things from out there. And we're not really sure if they really are from out there. They could be from right here. There's so many different possibilities. And this is why in ATIP, we've always said that all options have to be on the table until they're no longer on the table. And so back to your question, you know, aliens, UFOs, have I had seen hard evidence? I have seen hard evidence that there, that there is technology out there that's not made by us. But whether to say that they're aliens from out there. Okay, let's start on that though. Yeah. Let's start with that one. And then I'll, I'll go a little bit deeper. So technology you've seen that is not made by us. Okay. You've personally witnessed it. You've seen it right in front of you. I've held it in my hand, material. Okay. What was unique about this technology? Sure. Well, let's let's start with material science, right? Okay. So let's take this pen, for example. I'm in the desert, and I find this pen on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to look at this. I'm going to do a physical analysis, right, okay. at the macro level. I'm yep. going to look at it. It's hard. It's plastic. Uh, it's kind of cylindrical. Do some measurements. How much does it weigh? And then what I'll probably do is go and do a chemical or molecular analysis where I'm now going to go and I'm going to see the actual relationships of the, of, the, of the molecules themselves. And I can see that there's some stainless steel, maybe some rubber and how, it how, how they are arranged, those molecules. 
And then what I'm going to do is say, you know, this is really unique enough. Um, I'm going to do a, a, an atomic analysis. I want to look at things like isotopic ratios, which are, there's a, a varying degree of isotopic ratios that are found in nature. When you mm -hmm. find them that are outside that spectrum, then they're not natural, meaning they've been engineered or they're from somewhere else. So case in point, uh, there was a little dagger that was found back when we found Tutankhamun's, um, his, his tomb back in the 20s. And it was a little dagger. Nobody paid much attention to it until they did, did analysis on it. And they realized that the nickel content in that dagger was not found on Earth. It actually came from an asteroid. And that's why that dagger was so important, why they buried it with King Tut, because it was made from an asteroid. So that's how we can tell if something is made naturally here on Earth or if it's not. And then you're going to look at the arrangements of the atoms themselves in, the, in basically a, a, a lattice-type matrix. matrix. How, how were the atoms arranged? Now, keep in mind, to arrange atoms very specifically is A, very costly, and B, takes a lot of technology and sophistication to do. We only recently have had that technology to arrange atoms that accurately, right? So when you find a piece of something and it does not have, it's, it's clearly engineered, it's got a beveled edge, it's been manufactured, and it's been put away in, in it together in a way that we cannot replicate still, right? And then turns out, oh, by the way, this material comes, it was found decades ago. You are then forced to ask the questions, logical questions. Okay, well, if we can't make it, we didn't make it, who did? Who has the technology, right? So the further back in time you go, the more you realize no one had that technology. So if you found, let's say, a garage door opener and you were Michael Da Vinci and you were walking in the desert and you find a garage door opener back in the 1600s, um, you've never, didn't discover plastic and certainly the electromagnetic spectrum wasn't even discovered, right? So who built it? It doesn't make sense that you're going to find this material that is so precisely engineered and you're going to be able to, and, and by the way, some country built it three decades ago, four decades, ago, five decades ago. Um, and so that's, that's how that scientific analysis is so important. Now, let me caveat. I did not do the analysis. I am not a trained material scientist and I'm not a, a material engineer, but we had people in the government who were. And we had organizations, very reputable organizations. For example, let's say NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, right? The best of the best conduct analysis. And when they come back with a big goose egg and say, look, man, I, I can't tell you where this came from. I have no idea. But we, we cannot manufacture What's that. it capable of doing? Well, that's, that's a great question. It, apparently, it can do all sorts of interesting stuff, but we're not sure yet. Because it's, it's, it's part of something else, part of a bigger system, right? It's like this pen. If I find just the pen cap of it, well, it's interesting and I think I know what it does, but maybe it can do a whole lot of other things. So, so we don't know yet everything it can do. We, we have some theories. Some of the folks that I work with at OSAP and ATIP have some very interesting Such theories. Such as? So one is, uh, is multiple waveform capabilities. Another one is um, potentially some sort of integravitic, meaning the ability to defy the natural effects of Earth's gravity without the associated technologies, right? There's These are purely assumptions, or is there a reason based on a certain formula they saw to say that's capable of doing X, Y, Z? Actually tests. So it wasn't, it wasn't either. Oh, okay. it, wasn't, it was actually tests that yeah. they did. And they said, hmm, this is a very interesting property. If you take this material and you bombard it with X terahertz uh, of, uh, of radiation, uh, interesting things start to Which happen. Which we didn't do because we don't know what it's capable of. It could even be explosive, right? So did we test it out or... Um, so I have, Cause you're playing with fire a little bit, no? Yeah, sure. Every time you have something that you of unknown origin, you have to be careful. Um, just like this conversation, believe it or not, because I, i I was cleared by the Pentagon to talk about, uh, whatever's in there is cleared. I'm, I'm good to talk about. I have to be very careful though, about going beyond that because I don't have clearance to talk about that. I have not been cleared by the Pentagon. I still just full disclosure. I still maintain my security clearance with the government. Uh, I still consult from time to time. So they made it very clear to me that I have to be very careful not to talk about something that I'm not allowed to talk about. Um, so again, I'm being a little bit vague on purpose, but yes, if you have material, let's say this pen, you find in the middle of the desert and you start finding interesting properties associated with this pen, 
And by the way, it was made at a time where we couldn't manufacture pens. We didn't have the technology. Now you have something very okay, interesting. Okay, so for the last four years, every time we do podcasts, I have to ask Rob or somebody, hey, can you pull up the snooze? Can you pull up that? Can, which way do these guys lean? Can you go back to the timeline of, eventually after asking so many questions, I said, why don't we design the website that we want aggregated? We don't write the articles. We feed all of it in using AI. So nine months ago, eight months ago, I hired 15 machine learning uh, engineers. They put together our new site called vtnews.ai. What this allows you to do when you go to it, if, look, if you go to that story right there that says Trump proposes overtime pay, click on it. It'll tell you how many sources are reporting on this from the left. If you go to the right, Rob, it says left sources, click on it. Those are all the left sources. If I want to go to right sources, those are the stuff. If I want to go to center, I go there. Now, if I want to go all the way to the top and I want to find out a lopsided story, a story that only one side is reporting on, either the left or the right. So if you notice the first one, uh, we'll say Zelensky announces release of 49 Ukrainians from Russia. Notice more people on the left are reporting on that than the right. If I go to the middle one, same thing. If I go to the right one, same thing. You can see what stories are lopsided. And if I pick one of the stories, pick the first story, uh, uh, click on a Trump one proposes overtime tax cuts. To the right on the AI, I can ask any question I want, but click on the first question that has it. It says, what is the political context and potential motivation behind the tax Trump's new tax cut uh, proposal, click on the question mark. It explains exactly what the motives are. So for you to use, whether you're doing a podcast, you're in the middle of a podcast, or you just want to know it for yourself, you're busy like myself. And last but not least, this is all AI doing this, some machine learning engineers. Go all the way to the top. I can go to timelines, go to timelines, and see how far back a story goes. Pick the Israel-Palestinian conflict. If I want to go to that and go back and see why are some those two days a big spike, I'll have Rob pull it over to go to those two days with a big spike, and I'll see exactly what happened on that day or the previous day, and many other features vtnews.ai has. So simply go to vtnews.ai. There's a freemium model, there's a premium, and then there's the insider. If you want to have unlimited access to the AI, click on the VTAI Insider. You can now become a member effectively today. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.